Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arlo Fori of the African Dream. Good evening. I am Rian, and I work at the University of Stellenbosch, which is 40 minutes away from Cape Town. The capital of South Africa? Well, that's what we like to think. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, yeah, the we capital have, is Pretoria, a, right? The capital is Pretoria, Swane, but we like to think of ourselves as the mother city. <laughs> so nice. that's that's the point of reference. Cool. I I've been working at Stellenbosch since 2007. For two years before then, I was lecturing at the University of the Western Cape, where I also was trained in undergraduate and postgraduate studies, as well as learning to teach as an English tutor, studying and teaching English literature. This is the African dream, and we try to talk about, you know, happenings in and out of the African continent. And so we'll um, start talking about Nelson Mandela, since you're yes. from South Africa. May he so rest in peace. Now, tell us where you were and what you were doing when you heard about the death of Nelson Mandela. I was in a town called George, which is on the famous garden route of the Western Cape which is a route that leads one straight into the Eastern Cape. The Eastern Cape is where Mr. Mandela was born. Right. And I felt that I was closer to him than I would have been had I been in Cape Town. I was virtually as close as I could have been at that moment, and it felt right because it's sad news, and you will always remember where you were as a right. South African when you received the news of Mr. Mandela's passing. When you heard the news and you finally confirmed that it's a fact, oh boy, Madiba is gone, how did you feel? Firstly, the feeling of may soul rest in peace. Uh, also feeling of gratitude for what he meant to all of us. To mention the name Mr. Mandela is to immediately remember the legacy of Mr. Mandela and not in just an abstract way to, to look around one as a South African and be grateful for his contribution in, in the basic democracies are the basic virtues of democracy that we can enjoy. So these are all the things that passed through my mind. I had been vaguely watching something on my computer and listening to music right. when a friend sent a text message. And in that moment, I realized the enormity of it, but I also quite couldn't fathom all of that. A few months earlier, I'd been away in Barcelona, and I'd enjoyed my time there. but. Every day I was following news reports of Mr. Mandela's health, right. which was making news around the world on a daily basis. And I felt, <coughs> as much as I enjoy my residency in another country, as a South African, I would want to be home if and when the event of Mr. Mandela's passing should occur. The burial of Nelson Mandela brought a lot of world leadership and attention to South Africa. There I hear there were about 90 presidents and heads of states all over the world that were in attendance. Now that Nelson Mandela has been buried, how is South Africa moving on? So Africa, from my point of view right now, right. is moving on respectfully as one does after an event like this. There were some ups and downs. It was an enormous event that I don't think any country could have been prepared for, for the kind of global outpouring, for the tributes, um, for people's uh, remembrances of Mr. Mandela, and then for 90-odd world leaders to come to the same memorial service. Right. It's, it's something unprecedented. I don't think any country could have been prepared for it. And there was something in that that I think was always going to leave a feeling of emotional turbulence. But this is also natural after the passing of someone that's dearly loved. And as far as I know, Mr. Mandela is dearly loved around the world. Obviously. The, the country mourned on a scale that I've never seen before in, well, in media coverage of, of certain events. I, it's on the scale of, of a celebrity passing. I, I remember the coverage of Princess Diana's death in 1997. Mm. I've read media reports on the death of John Lennon in 1980. It's pretty much on those lines, and it's unusual because a political figure doesn't really have that kind of a mass impact. Uh, everywhere in every country there were tributes. And in South Africa, there were daily gatherings of crowds outside important buildings, monuments in South Africa, flowers left at, at statues, and a respectful mourning of a beloved father figure for the country. And since he, had been, uh, he has been buried, the, there's been a respectful silence about it too. It hasn't been making newspaper or headlines for the wrong reasons. It's a respectful passing. Africans do 
respect um, the recently departed. I can't too much agree with that. Now, you know, one thing was very obvious in the passing of Mandela, especially in South Africa. Of course, we talked about the fact that he was dearly mourned, but immediately after, you know, the news of his death was announced, people were gathering at his residence, singing and dancing. They were literally celebrating. And it was not, you know, a celebration to say, oh, finally Mandela is dead, but it was a celebration to celebrate his legacy, to remember him with all the happy thoughts and happy energy that the entire nation of South Africa could gather. And um, it was very poignant. When Barack Obama was making his tribute, he made us aware of the fact that Mandela is gone, but let's remember him for all the good things that made the world come mm -hmm. together. Now, what do you um, have to say about the Obama speech? President Obama's speech captured, firstly, the humanity and the humanism, um, this, this universal humanism that Mr. Mandela was such a key contributor to. And I feel coming from President Obama, who had a reception unlike any other world leader I think has ever enjoyed in South Africa, was rather poignant. Um, the crowd that day in Johannesburg really took to Mr. Obama, which surprised even me as much as I know he's, he's called President Swagger. <laughs> and he's got the swag, he's, he's, he's a great public speaker, we know this. But on that day to appeal to these people was I think a poignant moment because in spirit, I think there was some kind of an associative link, some kind of definite sentimental connection, I think, that the crowd perceived right. between Mr. Obama and Mr. Mandela. Both are charismatic figures, and both can draw crowds. Um, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of specter. I know Mr. Mandela has departed, so, but I speak of him in the present tense as a specter. Mm. The Mandela name still draws attention. And I think Mr. Obama's presence in, in Johannesburg on that day was an indicator of, of people looking to find elements of what was always called the Madiba magic, the Mandela magic, in others. And in that moment, I think they identified strongly parts of that with Mr. Obama. What are some of the things that you think, you know, unite South Africa with the passing of Mandela? With Mandela's legacy and those of us who acknowledge a debt, a debt of gratitude, um, the debt of our democracy, really. That's, that's a uniting factor. But a larger uniting factor is actually perhaps the same factor that sometimes still causes tension between us, and that's the factor of discomfort. Apartheid is meant to be uncomfortable. Right. It's meant to be an uncomfortable reference point. It's meant to be uncomfortable every time we mention it in any kind of conversation because it's hardly an abstraction. It's hardly something trivial in history. People suffered. People's humanity had been wrenched away from them. And Mr. Mandela fought for that. And more and more, in the wake of his death and with a recent film about his life um, still in the circuit. The Long Walk to Freedom. The Long Walk to Freedom. Idris Elba was playing Mandela. Yes, yes, <laughs> that one. With, with that still in the air, Mr. Mandela's Rivonia trial speech um, before his sentencing to Robben Island seems to really, it's give, been given something of a rebirth, and it reminds people of the discomfort, um, that which Mr. Mandela fought against. And that discomfort, I think, is the strongest legacy. He asked us to forgive but never to forget. And we cannot forget whether apartheid is raised by greedy politicians to win certain trivial arguments, whether it's a certain kind of bargaining tool, whether it's an acknowledgement of guilt, whether it's just something that will drive most people out of a room seeking more pleasant conversation elsewhere, it's meant to remain what it, what it always was, something right. that should never have happened. And Mr. Mandela's legacy is in that. There's a reason why we praise him for his actions um, and for his actions upon leaving prison, because a large portion of his life was taken away fighting for this cause, um, which he said, years. 27 <laughs> odd years. Something which his Rivonia trial speech reminds us of he was willing to die for.
and that's the fight for everyone's basic humanity. And it's something that he proved when he was given the opportunity of leading South Africa into democracy. Do you think South Africa is at that place where it can say, yes, there is equal and fair opportunity to every single South African? No, South Africa is not at that place yet. There's, there can only be more and more continued efforts at reaching that point. It is not there yet. It is a dismantling of an undesirable history. Um, it's, it's not just the, uh, the history of apartheid from 1948 onwards. It's the colonial history of the country. Um, it's the history of, of European settlement in the country. It, it's, a long, it's a long history. Um, it's not dissimilar to the narrative of many other African countries, as you would know. Right. And those are, are scars that still demand a sensitivity in their treatment, that still ask for us to be aware of each other at all times. And as the world moves on, as modernity progresses, it is also natural for humans to want to be a part of everything else. So there's that. There's being where the world is. and uh, We have internet and smartphone devices to catch us up, to keep us in the moment, to be here now, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But there's also this idea that we still have to look back. Forgive but never forget, um, as Mr. Mandela also encouraged us. And at times we get conflicted. I think we're a young democracy. We're a teenage democracy. We're going to behave as a teenager does. And it's evident in where South Africa is at now. It's not at the most desirable place in terms of fair and equal rights, but we need to concentrate to remember the lessons of those who sacrificed their freedom for, the freedom we have now, and to acknowledge this debt. For youngest Africans, it's very easy to be bored of this talk of debt and struggle because, in all fairness, that struggle was fought for them to have the democracy they have now. Right. But there are still these elements that bind, these ties that bind them to the past, and there should be some kind of acknowledgement, which there is, but it needs to be worked at, to be continued, um, so that sacrifices that people like Mr. Mandela, like Oliver Tambo have made for the country, are not sacrifices in vain. We will get there, surely, but we are a teenage democracy. How has the life and death of Mandela influenced yours today? Most Mandela's death struck me the same way his life did. It makes me feel very small. But small with, while knowing there's, there's that space of growth. And in his inauguration speech in 1994, when he became officially our first democratically elected president, right. he asked us, who are you not to be? And quite often we, uh, we get very humble, um, too humble. We get that post-postmodern condition. <laughs> we, we want to trivialize things. We want to separate ourselves from the enormity of things. Right. And we leave the enormous things to the enormous people. Mr. Mandela, great, he did all of these things. But his argument was that he was a man willing to take a stand. He was a human being and he was a humanist, which fundamentally are all things that we can be. So his death strikes me the same way his life did. I had the privilege of meeting him and in his company, in a room full of people and dignitaries of all sorts, everybody felt equally small. And it's rare to have people who exude that, to have somebody flatten a room by merely being her or himself in any which way. And his death just reminds me that there's a lot still to be done. I have no excuses for not doing them. Interesting. Now, um, before I let go of you, um, tell us, there is a lot of young generation in South Africa and across the world that do not know a lot about the legacy and life of Mandela. And um, I don't even deem myself to be someone who knows enough about Mandela. Now, how would you want the post-Mandela generation to remember the life of Mandela? How would you want your children in the future to remember the life and legacy of Mandela? That's a very good question. I think that question applies to so many South Africans right now. I would say that younger generations tend to, as I've said earlier, have a natural tendency to pull away from that which 
has such a great s influence, I would say, in, in their current position. It's, it's, it's natural to be a teenager in 2014 or to be a young adult um, in one's 20s in 2014 is different than having been one 20 years ago. True. And this is the way things are. Things must be like this. I would encourage the, those who are close, parents, relatives of these younger South Africans to have all the pertinent questions that young people would. To question the legacy, yes. Question the legacy, Mr. Mandela. Don't make a holy cow of him. That's the last thing he would have wanted. But to remember that with all information, with one more political analyst on the scene, with one more blogger on the scene, with all information at, your, at one's disposal, ask yourself why we still keep mentioning the names of Mr. Mandela, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., for instance. Why are these names still pertinent? And then take what we have learned from our readings and that which others teach us and to go back and to find the source of it and the source is unchanged the source for many people in the story of someone like Mr. Mandela would be the moment that he dedicated his life to the struggle for human rights for humanism um, more specifically almost African humanism because he fought for a community before he fought for himself which is very typical of African humanism and I would encourage that uh, Younger people can become quite bright with all the information at their disposal, which others perhaps didn't have so easily. With that information, go back to finding out why we are even reading about some of these people to begin with. That is a very poignant response, and uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure viewers out there would appreciate it as well. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Thank sir. Thank you and, very uh, much. We appreciate you passing by tonight. Thank you very much.